Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Fluharty, Dean of Penn School of Arts and Sciences, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural Penn Public Lectures on Classical Antiquity and Contemporary World. These lectures aim to advance the public good in the United States to enable a more civil, prosperous, and humane future. And they seek to achieve that through lively, rigorous, and timely engagement with the classical past. This series is a response to those inclined to imagine the present as a definitive rupture with the past, or to those who may be tempted to oversimplify the links between past and present. Every year, the series will be an invitation to those scholars whose work has expanded our understanding of Greek and Roman antiquity in all its complexity, to bring their insights into a conversation connected to real issues in our time. The series is made possible by a generous gift from the Eute Foundation in honor of Penn alumnus Edward E. Cohen, who I'm delighted to say is with us tonight, and his contribution to classical studies. The gift ensures that the Penn Public Lectures represent a new tradition in our school that will take place each fall for many years to come. We are so welcome. We are so pleased to welcome Joy Conley as the inaugural lecturer for this series, which will take place over three talks, the first beginning today and then continuing on April 19th and 21st. Joy's career and scholarship really embodies all of the themes the, pub, the Penn Public Lectures seek to promote, from her distinguished classical studies scholarship, for which she trained here in our classical studies PhD program, to the broad view of the humanities she is able to take now as the president of the American Council of Learned Societies. We are looking forward to hearing her important voice starting with today's talk entitled Public Matters, Prompts for the Study of Ancient Cultures. The Penn Public Lectures on Classical Antiquity in the Contemporary World are presented by our world-renowned Department of Classical Studies, whose chair Peter Strzok is with us, which has been long admired for its innovative approaches to examining classical antiquity. With this series, the department continues to look afresh at the discipline of classical studies and to consider how the field engages with the public, with the study of antiquity in other world regions, and with a range of contemporary topics like identity, nature, and politics. I am delighted that these lectures will provide such a valuable vehicle for that extremely important task. So thank you for being here today for the launch of this wonderful series, which I hope you will find both engaging and enlightening. Hello, everyone. I'm Edward Cohen. I was just discussing with Rita Copeland the fact that we always feel, no matter how old we get, that we're the same people who started on our course. Uh, I first came to Penn in 1957, but uh, I've seen such greatness over the decades that I really want to pay tribute to two entities who have really enhanced my life. The first, of course, is Penn's Classics Department, and the second is Joy Connolly's American Council of Learned Societies. First, Penn Classics, whose long history of innovation in ancient studies is being garnished yet again by this new lecture series. It's a series that's devoted, as Chairman Peter Strzok said, to exploring, quote, how the past is put to use in building the present. That's the end of Peter's quote. I don't want him to be responsible for what I now say. Because in my opinion, the process is also interactive in a Janus-like fashion. The present can also be put to use in understanding the past, even, or perhaps especially, the ancient past, even my own past. You see, Thucydides was the first author that I ever taught at Penn. 
and in November 1963, our class was beginning to discuss Thucydides' report of the first speech of Pericles that was made before the Spartan invasion. Pericles begins by saying, Tes gnomes, i.e., tes al tes, echome, me, achain, peloponnesios. He says, I have the same opinion as always. Don't make concessions to the Spartans. But before the class could go on to discuss why Pericles doesn't want to avoid uh, war by making what he says some might think to be a trifling assuagement, letting the merchants of Megara use Athenian markets, that was Sparta's key demand, can we use your markets? But before we could actually discuss it, we were disrupted by shouting in the hallway of College Hall, students weeping and embracing the news of the shooting of President Kennedy had reached us the old-fashioned way by human voice and sobs. We didn't even have mobile phones. That's how long ago it was. End of class, of course. And eventually, when a few days later, the next class resumed, the syllabus required that we turn to another speech. I never taught Thucydides again. I never published anything on Thucydides. I don't remember ever thinking about this again, about that passage. But a few weeks ago, before another, before another invasion, I heard the gallant voice of another leader speaking to his people about concessions. Volodymyr Zelensky, of course, the president of Ukraine. He explained that it might seem a trifling matter to agree not to seek membership in NATO, especially when NATO wasn't offering membership. But he said, if this concession were made, immediately the Russians would seek a further yielding, and so forth. The Russians were only testing, Zelensky said, the resolve of the Ukrainians. I then remembered that Pericles passage. President Zelensky's explanation was verbally close to Pericles, who had also insisted that the Spartans were only testing the Athenians' resolve, a demand that might seem trifling, frachu in ancient Greek, once conceded would be followed, Pericles said, by other, more significant commands. But we know much more in detail about the present crisis and its context, much more than the little that we actually know about the confrontation of 432 BCE. Here, the present, skillfully utilized, offers potential insight into the past. And I think as these lectures go on, we will find, I hope, and I expect, that the past and the present are really in interposition. Let me finish with a few words of appreciation to ACLS but not for the past, not for the critically helpful fellowship that ACLS awarded me in ancient times in 1962. Rather, you'll learn shortly why I'm so appreciate, appreciative to ACLS for electing Joy Connolly as their president. The present day standing of the humanities can be enhanced in many ways, but none, in my opinion, more strikingly than by the living example of a brilliantly humane individual. Now, I've only known Joy for some 30 years, but I can assure you, as you will see for yourselves very shortly, she is the very embodiment of the best, aspect, of the best aspects of humanism. And I think we're going to see that demonstrated in today's lecture. Peter? Good evening to everybody. My name is Peter Strzok. I'm chair of the Classical Studies Department at Penn. <clears throat> and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural Penn Public Lectures on Classical Antiquity and the Contemporary World. This is the spring kickoff of what will be an annual fall lecture series that aims to reimagine 
the study of Greek and Roman antiquity for our own times. In addition to our live audience here at the Penn Museum, we warm, warmly welcome our Zoom audience from around the world. My colleague James Carr will be keeping close touch with that group and will help moderate their participation in our question and answer session that follows this evening's lecture. There are more people to thank for getting the series off the ground than I have time to do, but for starters, recognition needs to go to the extraordinary faculty of Penn's Classical Studies Department. We started thinking about something like this back in 2017. It was clear to us that the ancient past needed a new future. And this spent countless hours of discussions, meetings, and debates, which might not seem like an appealing prospect. But if your conversation partners are the 14 preternaturally thoughtful and wise colleagues with whom I've had the pleasure of working for 20 years, you'd feel differently. Debating things you care about with people you admire might be the best definition I could give of happiness. We also have to give thanks to Rob Tempio and Princeton University Press, where Rob is a publisher. Our partnership with them dates back to 2018 and has been a pivotal piece for making this series work. Our partnership also with the Penn Museum and director Christopher Woods has given us a steady home base even as COVID kept moving the ground from underneath us since we aimed to start in the fall of 2020. Deans Fluharty and Kahlberg, thanks to you for your support uh, and encouragement as we brought this idea to fruition. Among the team that has been working behind the scenes to make this all happen, thanks are due to the staffs for advancement and news in the School of Arts and Sciences, to our intrepid graduate students in classical studies and ancient history, and especially to our department's chief administrator and resident magician, Sarah Gish Kraus, whose unflappable, uber-effective stewardship has made all of this work a reality. Our warmest thanks go to Jonathan Cohen and the Arete Foundation, Jonathan, you have absolutely shown what a person might do with a classical studies major from Penn. Our series has been generously supported by the Arete Foundation at which Jonathan is a principal in honor of Edward E. Cohen, who deserves special recognition this evening. Ed has taught at Penn for more than 50 years, as you just heard. Uh, he took his BA from the college in 1957, his JD from Penn Law in 1965, and in between he earned a PhD in classics from our neighbors to the north at Princeton. He's gone on to several distinguished careers, which he has pursued simultaneously, one of which is as an economic and social historian of classical Athens and Imperial Rome. In addition to dozens of articles in leading journals in our field, Ed has published five books with Oxford, Rutledge, and Princeton, with a sixth shortly on the way. With this lecture series, we aim to carry forward Ed's legacy of scrupulous scholarship always deeply engaged in the world and perspicacious vision for the future of the field. Ed, you have our thanks and our admiration. For all our goals and aims for this series, we could not imagine a more fitting beginning than the lecture you will hear this evening from Joy Connolly, whose series for this year's Penn Public Lectures on co-creating antiquities, I have the privilege of introducing to you this evening. If I were to sit down and design a human being who would be perfect for this, I would be hard pressed to improve on what Joy Connolly already brings to the prospect. Taking her BA in classics from Princeton in 1991 and her PhD in classical studies from Penn in 1997, Connolly has followed an exceptional and consequential path of accomplishment since then. She held faculty positions at the University of Washington and Stanford before a move to NYU, where she earned her rank of full professor and became Dean of the Humanities in 2012. In 2016, she began her service as provost and then interim president of the CUNY Graduate Center. And since 2019, she's been an advocate for all of the humanities and social sciences more generally in her role as president of the American Council of Learned Societies. These positions on their own are impressive enough, but what Connolly has done with these positions is what truly distinguishes her. She has, from the beginning, pressed the institutions she leads toward greater inclusion, engagement, and access. At NYU, she secured a major grant uh, to promote scholars of the humanities forming links into New York's urban communities. At CUNY, she pushed to transform graduate research toward public good and to expand career options for PhDs. She steered a major grant from the Mellon Foundation to develop a partnership with LaGuardia Community College and expanded non-degree programs that promote faculty engagement with the public in New York City. 
Her own research entirely aligns with these broader themes, linking the highest ideas of scholarship on ancient materials with the most urgent imperatives of the contemporary world. In her first book, The State of Speech, Rhetoric and Political Thought in Ancient Rome, published in 2007, Connolly examines the theories of rhetoric in late antique Rome in order to construct a template for citizenship for our own world, up to and beyond the horizon of our present time. The resulting work invoked comparisons in reviews by peers to Hannah Arendt and Elizabeth Rawson. Her next book, The Life of Roman Republicanism, published in 2014, deepens these inquiries and yields a new understanding for a model of citizenship in unstable times where a culture of rational deliberation faces real jeopardy. In perhaps the most common chord struck across the wide range of her scholarly corpus, Connolly has revealed that the public delivery of persuasive speech has a humanizing power. I am confident we are about to witness a proof of that concept in our lecture this evening on public matters, prompts for the study of ancient cultures. Please join me in welcoming Joy Connolly to inaugurate the Penn Public Lectures on Classical Antiquity and the Contemporary World. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all for coming. I am getting settled after almost two years of being away from in-person lectures. I'm remembering the materiality of paper and of looking out at real people, which is a wonderful thing to see. And I'm going to take a step away just to make sure my mic works when I'm not. Is it working now? OK, it needs, a, it needs a, an on button. How's that? Good? We're good to go. Excellent. Thank you for that test. So let me say again formally thanks to Peter for that wonderful introduction and to Ed for his just wonderful and inspiring words uh, and reminding me, and I'll have a little bit more to say about this later this evening, uh, about how long we've known each other and the inspiration you've had on, for me, um, Ed, for a long time, for 30 years. Uh, it's, it's all connected. I want to thank, too, um, Sarah Gish Kraus for uh, stewarding the, the complexities again of an in-person lecture at a time when we're all just getting used to them again. Um, and especially, I want to thank the Arate Foundation, uh, Jonathan Cohen, for making this all possible. And lastly, before I thank the audience, uh, my old teachers, uh, and I don't mean to say old teachers, in that, <laughs> but my, my teachers in a prior time um, and, and colleagues and friends now, uh, I, I've been saying uh, throughout, throughout the day and actually to others I've spoken to in prior weeks, I hope my sound is still on, yes, okay, good, um, who have asked me, you know, who have said how excited I must be to come back and speak to uh, my old department at Penn, as people call it, and I've said there was no, I, I cannot imagine a, a more you know, inspiring and stimulating but deeply humane place to study, and I really became the person I am, largely because of my experience here. So I want to thank the faculty um, still here from, uh, from, the, from my time there and the others who have joined in the department and made it the amazing place it is. I'm just so honored to be here uh, giving these talks. It's good to be home. So thank you. So before, before COVID hit, when I spent a lot of time on planes, I often passed the time in conversation with fellow frequent flyers. And almost inevitably, we would come to that question, what do you do? What do you do for a living? And my answers, classics or classicist, elicited what you can all, I think many of you in this audience, elicited pretty predictable reactions. Some people guessed I studied music, possibly Beethoven or the Beatles. Older people shared memories of their Latin classes in Catholic schools, sometimes fond memories, sometimes resentful ones. But over the years, more and more frequently, the reaction I got was surprise. It was perfectly friendly surprise, wasn't negative, but clearly my fellow travelers found my course of study strange or quaint, and almost totally free of significance, utterly disconnected from their world. So my discomfort over the years grew not because I was distressed at their lack of familiarity with the field, or at least not just that or mainly that. It was because my efforts at short but persuasive explanations, the amount of time you have in a plane with someone, 
My efforts to justify my study, my attempts to link past and present, to talk above all about the importance of tradition, they were retelling a story that I no longer fully believed. So 215 years ago, in 1807, Friedrich August Wolff dedicated to Goethe his Darstellung der Altertumswissenschaft nach Begriff, Umfang, Zweck und Wert, or his presentation of the science of antiquity according to its conception, scope, purpose, and value. Clearly a work understated of scant promise. <laughs> and I want to take this opportunity, this honor, as the inaugural speaker of a newly endowed series on classical studies in the contemporary world to tackle Wolf's theme. And I have the temerity to add one more term to that huge scope, Zukunft, future. I want to talk about the field known in English as classics or classical studies and now increasingly ancient Mediterranean studies, its intellectual foundations, their strengths and weaknesses, and about what I think represents its best future. You might be thinking you've heard this story before, Classics in Crisis, or Crisis in Classics. It's a perennial theme, the title of a collection Lowell Edmonds ed uh, edited over 30 years ago, I think in 1989. But I, I want to emphasize this point very strongly. It is not crisis that prods me on. At least that's not the whole story. I want us to think bigger, to redesign, or at least recalibrate the field to meet the world where it is today, to embrace our historical role as a founding discipline in the modern academy, to lead the humanities and indeed the arts and sciences as a whole more generally in responding to the fact that the world around us has changed while our institutional organization in academia has stayed much the same. We've added fields in the American Academy, but structurally speaking, we've tended not to change existing ones. So I won't talk about preservation or advocacy or outreach, but rather how we can make the field our field, the source of answers to questions that matter now, questions about public matters. I do this out of my passionate belief that studying the ancient past has distinctive value, and I do it too with what I hope is the right mix of boldness and humility. I'm keenly aware that this is a topic no one person can reasonably hope to handle alone. And this is really the reason I chose the title uh, for the, the overarching title for these three lectures, co-creating antiquities, with an emphasis on that Latin root, co, for cooperate. I'm indebted to other scholars who are thinking critically and creatively about the science of antiquity, as Wolf called it, including Penn's own Joe Farrell, who delivered a thoughtful presidential address to the Society for Classical Studies a few years ago that spurred my thinking here. Also, my editors and fellow writers of essays about the future of the field gathered in the forthcoming issue of TAPA, the Transactions of the American Philological Association, the writers for the online journal Eidolon, which ran from 2015 to 2020, the new editors of the online feature Pasts Imperfect, and others I'll cite as I go. And I want to thank you in the audience, too, for your willingness to participate as co-thinkers with me. And here I have to confess, I'm addressing myself to people, members of the public interested in the field, uh, as equally along with members, practitioners in the field, graduate students, faculty, uh, scholars outside the academy as well. You might find, I have to say, you, you might find the conversation uncomfortable. You might feel relief. You might feel anger. You might react by saying, finally. You might say, absolutely not. You might say, hmm, let's talk further. So I'm ready for anything. Let's be ready for anything. And we have all of next week to keep talking too. This afternoon, I'll start by examining the distinctiveness of what we call the classical text. This is going to lead us to a popular origin story for classical studies and the vulnerability that that, study, that story reveals in our conception and value of the field. Next Tuesday, to give you a little preview, I'll discuss how the field narrowed in focus to the study of Greece and Rome and how this creates both epistemological and political problems, but also, interestingly, valuable habits of thought, which are worth further reflection. And in the third lecture on Thursday, I'll delve more deeply into those habits of thought and where they might take the study of the ancient past in the years to come. And this will be a kind of manifesto moment. We can talk about manifestos and revolutions. The spirit of my approach here is captured by Ezra Pound, a thinker I've been wrestling with for over 30 years. He says, at this point, we must make a clean cut between two kinds of ideas, ideas which exist 
and or are discussed in a species of vacuum, which are, as it were, were toys of the intellect, and ideas which are intended to go into action or to guide action and serve us as rules and or measures of conduct. And for a less politically toxic guide, we might look to the Elizabethan reader, Gabriel Harvey, who studied Latin texts for ideas and tactics he could put into immediate practice in the court in which he lived. Tony Grafton and Lisa Jardine note, looking at his work, early modern readers did not passively receive, but rather actively reinterpreted their texts. We intend to take that notion of activity in a strong sense. This is, and they're talking about Harvey's reading, Harvey's reading is intended to give rise to something else. Like Pound and Harvey, I too am studying for action, reading the history, in this case, in these lectures, the history of classical studies, with the intention of giving rise to something else. So let's start by defining that common object of study. And it's not the only object of study in classics departments or classical studies departments, but it's a common one, and that's the classical text. What is that? Well, by text, I should say, I have in mind a range of things. Written texts, including poems that emerge from an oral tradition, like Homer, artworks, sculpture and painting and the like, and the built environment, including urban plans and buildings. Italo Calvino, writing about what makes a classic back in 1991, it still gets cited today, came up with 14 definitions. Now these are of classic books, not classical texts as I've defined them, but there's interesting overlap and two of his answers wind through my argument here. Number seven, and you can look up the rest uh, on your own time. He says, the classics are those books which come to us bearing the aura of previous interpretations and trailing behind them the traces they have left in the culture or cultures through which they have passed. And number 10, a classic is the term given to any book which comes to represent the whole universe, a book on a par with ancient talismans. But one thing is missing from Calvino's list possibly because it represents the gap between what is classic, his concern, and what is classical, which is mine. The Greek and Roman texts we label classical, I think, share a quality I call publicness. This publicness takes several forms, and some are more obvious than others. To start with the obvious, many iconic classical texts are about public matters, war, politics, the events preserved as collective memory rather than as remem remembrances of an individual or a family. These texts represent a world where life, or at least the parts worth remembering and writing about, was lived in public. The spaces and buildings that have come to stand for ancient Athens and the Roman Empire, the Parthenon, the Roman Forum, the little forums all over the empire in places like France, Morocco, and Turkey served public functions. Even texts that explore individual experience, knowledge, or nature, Plato's dialogues, the love poems of Catullus or Propertius, they pursue the tensions between the life of the mind or the heart and the life lived in public with its promise of eternal memory. A high proportion of the texts we study are engaged with matters of the public good, the definition of the citizen, the responsibilities of, this, of citizenship, as Peter kindly drew attention to in his summary of my work, something I've been interested in for a long time, the nature of justice, of tyranny and corruption, the experience of war, how we can live well in company with others, which ways of going about farming or religious worship or the law best serve the common weal. Call it history or call it fantasy, but the classical text in its publicness stands for an era where people, or at least free men, lived life at a level that was at once more intimately communal and larger and historically momentous, even potentially heroic, a stark contrast to the small, consumerist, highly administered lives humans lead in industrial and post-industrial modernity. Now, none of this is an accident. Classical texts exist as such largely because they were called upon to help early modern Europeans develop a self-consciously public discourse, distinct from and often in opposition to the hierarchies of the Catholic Church and the nobility. The scholarly tools that became the bedrock of modern classical studies were invented to answer early modern questions of public matters of politics and religion. Above all, the need to determine what constitutes legitimate state power the need for a secular language of authority, and the need to distinguish false texts from accurate ones. All those with 
contemporary re resonance I hardly need pause to point out. For those seeking alternatives to monarchy and the church, Latin and then Greek texts, once Manuel Chrysoloris came to Italy to teach Greek in the 15th century, proved immensely useful because they helped introduce new terms and values of public life while offering the extra benefit of an anchor in the legitimacy conferring Greco-Roman past. The goal was to clear space for exercising legitimate authority outside the terms of the medieval order. Latin and Greek texts helped dislodge the subject of the church and replace it with the self-governing subject of the state. And I'm drawing here from, in my language, from the work of Sylvia Winter, whom we're going to talk about on Tuesday. Scholars at the University of Bologna and then other places fostered the study of Roman law, which aided local governance and played various roles in the struggle for legitimate authority among popes, local nobles, and the Holy Roman Emperor. Piero Paolo Vergerio, who lived from 1370 to 1445, he was an early biographer of Petrarch. He argued that learning both Latin and Greek literature together made the perfect stepping stone to becoming a citizen and a philosopher, because the two languages and access to the literature that they offer bring together the two arts of eloquence and philosophical reasoning that Plato had wrongly tried to split apart. Latin historiography and rhetoric proved especially valuable to self-governing urban city-states and the civic consciousness they sought to promote. Leonardo Bruni's 12-volume History of the Florentine People, produced in 1442, is a great example of the heroic framework for writing local history that Roman writers Livy and Sallust made available. As markets opened up and social mobility increased, instruction in the Ars Dictaminus, the art of letter writing, and works on personal style, like Castiglione's brilliant 1528 Art of the Courtier, offered aspiring men access to authoritative styles of professional self-expression and social capital. And dozens of Italian texts did this service. Coluccio Salutati's On Tyrants, uh, Machiavelli's Discourses on Livy, and many more. All these works are products of what Chris Salenza has called a dialogical thought world where readers could form personal relationships with and engage in dialogue and debate with ancient thinkers. Knowledge of the languages, of course, also made possible the close engagement with Christian scripture that animated early Protestant thought. There is, and I feel like I can see it even in the, in the beautiful illumination on this manuscript, there is a confident redemptive quality to this work in the sense that the Studia Humanitatis could help, both, help save both the state and the self, and in the sense that the modern Studia could, also, could both assimilate and surpass ancient thought. Well, this is the familiar origin story retold in many books, most recently by James Turner's philology and by Cambridge School scholars doing contextual intellectual history like Quentin Skinner, whose book is pictured here, uh, and John Pocock. And even today, many departments of classical studies proclaim on their websites that the reason classical texts are worth studying today is their publicness, even if they don't use that word. It's my word so far. These texts are presented as offering a civic education appropriate for citizens of a democracy. They create a tradition of thought on which we can draw, a tradition all the more distinctive because it talks to itself. It doubles back on itself over time. And here is another important aspect of what makes a text classical. Part of their publicness is their making visible a dialogue into which, in principle, anyone can enter. And they appear to have done this from the very beginning. So the dialogical thought world that the humanists explored, actually, or created, excuse me, mirrored the dialogues among the texts that they edited and published. From the lyric poets and Aeschylus's habit of invoking Homer, Greek and Latin texts are notable for the conversations they engage in and into which they tug readers. The tendency of Greek poets and scholars to look backward, to generate lists of the best, that then mark out the field on which learning and debate proceed, appears as early as Aristophanes' frogs. After the death of Alexander the Great, Hellenistic scholars make that habit professional in the Library of Alexandria, where they generate catalogs and commentaries on the best works of lyric, epic, history, and oratory. Alluding to earlier writers and setting up competition as the staging of poems themselves are common tactics for Hellenistic poets. 
The third century BCE Alexandrian poet and scholar Callimachus attacks rivals he calls the Telkines in the first lines of his Aetia, which I read with Ralph Rosen years ago here at Penn. His contemporary Theocritus wrote a series of poems called Idols that begin with an exchange between shepherd singers who sing in a bucolic landscape that Theocritus creates by reworking scenes from the 17th book of Homer's Odyssey. By creating a literary culture around the imitation of these and many other Greek writers, Romans amplify the Greek habit of engagement with the past to such a degree that the German-American thinker Hannah Arendt claimed that they invented, the Romans invented, the idea of tradition itself. This is key to the enduring appeal and power of Greek and Roman literary texts, that writers create a world of ideas, images, settings, and tropes in conversation across time and space. It's part of the complex filtering process that constitutes canon formation starting in antiquity. The texts that are selected for are the ones that perform their own knowledge of literary culture, particularly of the past, that highlight through their gestures of allegiance or disagreement with other texts that they belong in that world. Now this might strike us as a conservative or even coercive constraint, this emphasis on conversation and belonging. But Arendt, for one, did not find this relation a binding or limiting one. Quite on the contrary, she argued that the encounter of reader and text gives rise to new thinking, new ideas, an effect she thought was crucial to human survival and that was amplified by readers' knowledge that, in fact, they belong in the conversation, this series of readerly encounters over centuries. This is the world Arendt worried was vanishing the world throughout her life she sought to save. She warned about the 20th century habit of violently pushing the past aside in favor of a bright new future, a habit she linked with the rise of authoritarianism and totalitarianism, and she renders the act of reading Greek and Roman texts an entry into a conversation with another that awakens us to our need for others. Hers is akin, I think, to the more recent call by the historian Saidiya Hartman to do history as an act of care for the past and for those who have gone before us. In this view, reading past texts by embedding us in their alien particularity enjoins us to love the world, a phrase I'll come back to. But the real question for me now is, who belongs to this world, to this conversation, to these acts of engaged reading, and who doesn't? And this is an important question because historically the world of the tradition, uh, the traditional canon, is also the world of public matters, the public sphere. This world whose loss Arendt so feared is the same world James Baldwin viewed from a distance with a mix of desire, pain, irony, frustration, and rage. Reflecting on the Swiss village he lived in during the summer of 1951, Baldwin wrote, this village, even were it incomparably more remote and incredibly more primitive, is the West, the West onto which I have been so strangely grafted. These people cannot be, from the point of view of power, strangers anywhere in the world. They have made the modern world, in effect, even if they do not know it. The most illiterate among them is related, in a way that I am not, to Dante, Shakespeare, Michelangelo, Aeschylus, Da Vinci, Rembrandt, and Racine. The, the Cathedral at Chartres says something to them, which it cannot say to me, as indeed would New York's Empire State Building, should anyone here ever see it. Out of their hymns and dances come Beethoven and Bach. Go back a few centuries, and they are in their full glory. But I, I am in Africa, watching the conquerors arrive. Baldwin reminds us that the turn to Greek and Roman texts in early modernity seems like a liberatory development in its local and regional context, and so it absolutely was for many men, and some women too. But step back from the local and the regional, and consider humanist scholarship in the long 16th century in, the, in its global context, and we see that it's didactic, legal, exhortatory and pedagogical texts were deployed to advance a narrative where Europeans dominated the rest of the world, a world that was not European and therefore not civilized and even not fully human. This is the great divergence, the start of European exploration, extraction and colonization of lands around the world. 
key to the evolution of the economy that rapidly dominated the world was the development of an epistemology, a new universalist ideal of man. Classical texts gave flesh and soul to that man. And using these texts and then anointing them as the basis of all human learning does the political work of anchoring Europeans in a tradition of the best, the aspirational, the dominant, of the act of ordering itself. Earlier scholars and poets had already given a name to the relation of European readers to Latin and Greek texts, translatio studii, the transmission of studies. In the 1170s, the French poet Chrétien de Troyes wrote, our books have taught us that Greece had the first fame of chivalry and learning. It was 1170, after all. Then came chivalry to Rome and the sum of learning, which now is come to France. God grant that it remain there and that it find the place so pleasant that it will never depart. The philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah has described translatio studi, studii as the notion of Western civilization as a golden nugget passed from hand to hand, a story that helps demarcate Christian Europe and distinguish it from the Muslim East, despite the fact that Aristotle and other Greek texts central to the operation survived mainly thanks to the labor of Muslim scholars. In the course of the great divergence, by choosing to root itself in a very distant past, a very different past, by naming itself heir to this large-scale iteration of translatio studii, Europeans made themselves and made Europe the place where history has always happened and is made to happen to others. The 1550 Valladolid debate where the humanist friar Juan Gine Sepulveda drew on Aristotle and biblical scripture to argue that indigenous Americans were by nature unable to govern themselves is a powerful example of how Europeans rooted their claim of superiority over others in their privileged exchange with Greek and Roman texts and ideas. The man in this story is European, Christian, and human. Indigenous Mexicans are neither European nor Christian, or at least not yet, and their humanity, as Sepulveda argues, is a matter for Europeans to judge. Now, we all know this history, um, different pieces of it. Uh, we've thought about it in recent decades with special intensity in the field. But as a field, we've also chosen to live with the knowledge of the field's origins and allegiances and persistent associations, and I think bolstered by the, the good and kind of virtuous in and of itself liberal confidence that we can bracket its prejudices and limitations, or we can right the balance through self-reflection and critique. And my question is, can we continue to do so? And one reason this question is so difficult to answer is that classical texts have such a long history of attracting and then empowering those people who are able and willing to fight their way to a place at the table. I mentioned early modern women a few minutes ago. And one famous example is the Protestant theologian Olympia Murata, who spoke fluent Latin and Greek at the age of 12 and lectured on Cicero to the court of Ferrara in the 1540s. Scholars of the history of classical studies have started to tell uh, more and more frequently the stories of many more such fighters, from Phyllis Wheatley to Frederick Douglass to W.E.B. Du Bois, and this is just one set of examples from one strand of the black American experience, far too many uh, to crowd onto a single slide. With effort, even James Baldwin found ways to engage, and his essay, Why I Stopped Hating Shakespeare, is one of the best testaments to that. In 2020, the president of the Modern Language Association, Simon Kikandi, a uh, professor at Princeton, explained in his presidential address that he reads Euripides because, and I quote, through the understanding of the sufferings and struggles of others, I can come to terms with my own past. Literature, Gikandi says, can help us see how to live together across differences and divisions. And he quotes W.E.B. Du Bois, a very famous uh, passage on the sanctuary from racist hate that canonical texts can provide. And du Bois says, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. And there are countless other examples. Now, some scholars have seen in the achievements of those who fight their way into the tradition, good reason to work with it on the grounds that it's possible to separate the texts and our methods for studying them out of their origins and the prejudicial baggage of superiority and inheritance that they carry. 
The medievalist Carolyn Dinshaw, for example, contends that we can queer our passion for past worlds. She's one of the inventors uh, and, and early founders and developers of queer studies in, uh, in medieval studies. She argues that the desire for, and I quote, partial affective communication, the desire for community, for even a touch across time, end quote, has served dominant political interests in the past, like the Valladolid debate, like to toxic ethnic nationalism, defenses of slavery, and so on and on. But, she says, studying past traditions also incorporates a critical sensibility and makes space for people resistant to the dominant order. As an object of study, her Middle Ages are, and again I'm quoting, a resource for subject and community formation and materially engaged coalition building. Dinshaw casts relations with the past as a communal experience in which we come face to face with and must reflect on the temporal dimension of the self and of community. Somewhat along some similar lines um, as Carolyn Dinshaw, Joe Farrell argued in his SCS presidential lecture that temporality was the source of the solution. He called for a redefinition and a redistri redistribution of the words ancient and modern that would help reorder our landscape and rebalance inequities. The writers of the group authored book Post Classicisms uh, take that argument in a slightly different direction, but along uh, aligned paths. They praise what they call the mobility of culture and argue that the encounter with the classical text is an opportunity to, and I use their phrase, reflect on our own situatedness. Condemning classics traditional habit of running to the extreme of aesthetic decontext decontextualization and the other extreme of historical, contextual, and teleological understanding, they cite uh, pieces, uh, art artworks and, and pieces of literature, works of literature like Derek Walcott's Omeros as an example of art as simultaneity, a kind of um, experiment in, 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 uh, in Einsteinian physics that blazes the path for a new classical studies shaped by a Nietzschean sense of the untimely. I think all these thinkers share the creative desire to, as Carolyn Dinshaw would say, queer time, or to draw an image from French thinker Michel Serre, to crumple time, to see time as a kind of handkerchief where widely separated points can be made adjacent if you squeeze it in the right ways. But if we leave the core of the field unchanged, even if we expand its temporal or adjacent re regional borders, even if we do crumple the handkerchief into a very tight ball indeed, are we simply reinforcing the value of the core? Ngugi Va Tiongo warns about this tendency, about overvaluing or continuing to value the core, in his manifesto for a global comparative literary study, in his 2012 book, Global Ectics, Theory and Politics of Knowing. As a Kenyan writer with deep and painful experience of the imperialist power of the English language, he is wary of the persistent cultural and literary imperialism of European and American academics. The essence of Ngugi's critique of contemporary literary fields is that they leave the fundamental epistemological question of who's at the center untouched. On the other side of the coin, if we follow Martin Bernal's controversial study, Black Athena, we might argue the classical tradition isn't really European at all. It takes other uh, inspirations, say, from Egypt. But this solution risks simply writing non-Europeans living in areas adjacent to Greece and Rome into the European universalist story. So where do we go from here? I confess I have encountered many times in, the, in recent years my own sense of, of no exit at these, at, at these moments when I look at the different possibilities in front of us and, um, and I consider the dominance uh, and, and the power of the traditions that we're grappling with. But I think we must face the radical change in the world that's gathered steam post-1945, post-1968, post-1980, and find new ways to conceive our work. Here in 2020, we are over 50 years into a global transformation. Decisive changes to the global order that was established in that long 16th century. The certainties that prevailed for most of that history, certainties that are deep in our cognitive frameworks, have justified the organization of knowledge in the college and the university, especially in Europe and America. And of course, that system has spread all over the world. 
The structures of knowledge marked in our disciplinary and departmental names and scholarly values legitimate and help maintain that old world order. Emmanuel Wallerstein, in his book Universal, U European Universalism, The Rhetoric of Power, um, puts it succinctly and, and, and uh, trenchantly, I'll say. The old order, he says, was partly dismantled first by the national liberation movements and then by the world revolution of 1968. It also suffered, it has also suffered from a structural undermining of its ability to continue the endless accumulation of capital that is its raison d'etre and the means that we, that we are called on not merely to replace, excuse me, this means we are called on not merely to re replace this dying world system with one that's significantly better, but to consider how we can reconstruct our own structures of knowledge. Wallerstein draws his inspiration from the Senegalese politician and poet Leopold Sedar Senghor, who called on the world to come to what he called the rendezvous point, the meeting place of giving and receiving knowledge that would upend uh, binaries and inequities. Can we change our identity and practice to acknowledge the fact of this 21st century world where, let's face it, the creation and, and distribution of knowledge is itself no longer the claim or property of that very recent invention, the West? What alternative framework might we create if we could? How can we better reflect the flows and exchanges of people and knowledge that constitute the world and also the academy today? Well, first, the study of the past has got to, I think, play a central role in our new world building. In an interview in the book Flame, world, Flame Wars, which was published in 1994, a landmark book that popularized the term Afro Afrofuturism, the black science fiction writer Samuel R. Delaney one of my favorite writers I might note as an aside said, and I quote, we need images of tomorrow and our people need them more than most. The historical reason we've been so impoverished in terms of future images is because until fairly recently, as a people, we were systematically forbidden any images of our past. Delaney's plea reminds me that the study of the past is, as I said a few minutes ago, an act of love. I don't mean love of the past or its people, or its artifacts per, per se. And some people, uh, some scholars love what they study and some absolutely do not. I mean rather really what Hannah Arendt called amor mundi, love of the world and what humans have made of it and what we might make of it if we understood ourselves better. If we direct and organize the study of the ancient past in a way that makes the most of the we who are doing the study these days, whether that's faculty or undergraduates or members of the public curious about antiquity, I think we would more generously express Amor Mundi through our scholarly care, but for the whole world, past, present, and future. So I propose that Altertums Wissenschaft, or classics, or classical studies, or ancient Mediterranean studies under various names, should not dominate in its current institutional form. In fact, if we look outside these walls, it really is already changing and has already changed right in front of us with increasing numbers of PhDs each year employed in departments of history, world literature, world culture, and humanities. Collectively, I think we can generate a form of study at every institution that opens its eyes and, and really takes on this shift and that also enjoys a, strong, a stronger epistemological foundation and a more compelling institutional future. I find the most promise and approaches like that taken by the editors of Pasts Imperfect, as I, uh, the group that I mentioned at the very beginning, who call for rebalancing the highly specialized study of Greek and Roman texts and history that's dominated academic study of humanity's ancient pasts with the work of connecting and comparing with scholars of Arabic, Chinese, Sanskrit, indigenous American languages. And I'll remind us all that the very first editions of the transactions of the American Philological Association, TAPA, included for years uh, in the 1860s and 70s, articles on the study of indigenous American languages. If you thought that that was an unusual insertion in my list, in fact, it was part of the origins of what we now call the Society for Classical Studies from the very beginning. We can make the most, I think, of our strong positions as experts in one branch of this science of antiquity to advocate for bringing together the branches into a single strong tree and conduct ancient studies on a global scale. 
Now you might be thinking at this point, hold on. In many departments around the country, and including programs here at Penn, have already embraced neighboring cultures and languages like ancient Egypt or Syriac. And that's true, but, and here's a teaser for next Tuesday, by the end of the next lecture, you'll see why I'm skeptical of regional efforts like this to escape the power of what I will call the Greece and Rome paradigm. That's one word, Greece and Rome. Academia is, I remind us, already very proudly global. So I see the greatest strength in building global chrono chronopolitical alliances across disciplines that, remember, were split long ago for purposes that are not ours. Then, if we do this, we would be in a position to reassess and return the past so as to unearth and, inf and infiltrate new futures into our present. I'm optimistic that this more ambitious rethinking will help us all sustain the study of all cultures and all languages that exist at a distance from us, and that study is at risk t today. So this means we must put aside the term classical and broaden the scope of the field beyond Egypt and North Africa and these contig contiguous areas that we're already beginning to develop better conversations with. We would reject the idea of just one single meaningful ancient world and stop referring to the ancient Mediterranean in that telling shorthand. By co-creating and co-studying multiple antiquities, we can redesign the borders of dominant region and race that classical studies was originally invented to define and defend. Global study means new priorities that would make the most of our skills and experience. Classical studies has a history of interdisciplinary collaboration. We are translators of languages that live in writing rather than spoken speech. We can collaborate in the work of writing, for example, the history of the understudied global south, which confronts many of the obstacles that, uh, uh, that our own study uh, in, in, in the context of the ancient Mediterranean does. We are expert constructors of meaning with limited resources, experienced in thinking about temporality, historicism, the accuracy of texts. Now, I don't pretend that this would be easy. <laughs> I don't pretend that we can know before we do it exactly what it would look like. But I am deeply compelled by the way the literary theorist and, and psychoanalytic thinker Jacqueline Rose puts it. She says, as I see it, the task for study, and she's thinking of literary studies, but I'm thinking of of the study of the ancient past. She says the task for studies is to find the forms of language, and they will have to be more than one, which allow for the connections between cultures of affiliation, of recognition, but also of antagonism without dissipating the voices in which they clash. In this context, pluralism, the ideal of happy coexistence, seems as useless finally as that form of liberalism which believes all cultures can be brought harmoniously into a single view. I think she's right that the rhetoric of pluralism and dialogue can conceal the revival of familiar patterns of domination as well as the depths of our differences. But this is exciting matter for study. It's also matter for next week. So let me remind you that on Tuesday, I'll discuss the narrowing of the field to the study of Greece and Rome and how this creates epistemological and political problems, but also habits of thought we might find valuable. And on Thursday, I'll delve more deeply into where those habits might take the study of the ancient past in years to come. In conclusion, let me say that I am optimistic, and this might be a matter of my nature, but I think it's more than that. I think it's also experience and talking to hundreds and hundreds of people over the years about these issues. And I'm thinking now about the humanities, not just classical studies. I do believe that we have the will and the power to change. But I've also spent over a decade in a range of administrative posts, from core curriculum director to dean to provost, and I know how terribly slow and difficult change in academia is. Whether we design this change or whether it's forced upon us, some kind of change will take place, though at different ways and speeds at different institutions. And what you all choose to do here at Penn next year, in response to these lectures, or in 10 years or 20 years from now, it's going to look different from what colleagues choose to do at places like Minnesota State, where scholars are already clustered in departments of world literatures and world cultures. The variety and what I've called the brutal hierarchy of our system of higher education makes change of any kind all the more complicated. It also makes starting now all the more urgent. From climate change to cross-cultural misunderstanding, 
from new technologies to authoritarian aggression. Public matters today are interlinked on a global scale. Our students are global. Our public is global. So our study ought to be global, not with Greece and Rome as the core and touchstone of something called classical or Western, but in active, equal conversation with other traditions. We need to co-create a new field from the ground up. So you can call me a pragmatic revolutionary. You can tell me I'm way behind the times and we're already well on the way. I think some, especially members of the emerging generation, may tell me that. You can argue I welcome all judgments, uh, every opinion, and right now I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. So um, we have two mics uh, available in the audience here. If you have a question, please just use the old fashioned method of raising your hand. Um, and for those on the Zoom audience, uh, um, Professor Carr will help steer questions uh, from, from you all. So question to start. Please. What did you think of Spike Lee's adaptation in Chirac of Lysistrata as a political movement, an adaptation of an ancient play to a current political situation? Great question. And it raises the question of, um, that I will actually talk a little bit more about on Tuesday, which is um, the question of reception studies and, and the studies of texts just like that, that transform um, that restage and adapt and transform Greek and Roman texts, in this case, a Greek, Greek comedy. Uh, I, I thought it was a really interesting and fabulous and thought-provoking movie myself. And I think that the, um, the reviews of it actually in, raised many good questions about why Lee was choosing to, to do this. And I saw it, um, and, and you know, this is just my opinion, I'm not a, I'm not a scholar of, of contemporary film, but. Um, but I saw it very much as Lee uh, showing off in the best possible sense of what he could do, you know, with this text and this story that was so familiar. And uh, to him and, and to the people he was working with, familiar not so much, I think, to audiences of Spike Lee films. As we, you know, so I, th I think he saw himself as, uh, as showing off a mastery and ability to exploit and rework and also conveying and kind of sharing, opening up, building bridges really between um, a Greek text that the uh, that audiences like the people in the movie, you know, might not be familiar with, largely because of inequities in education and um, and the other kinds of, of inequalities that he explored in that movie. So, um, so really interesting and courageous and. Um, in its use of music and, uh, and, and different genres, you know, also aesthetically really daring. Uh, I, in a way, would love to see another, you know, him make another movie about the Ramayana or about, you know, I would love to see him engaging in global traditions. Again, this is just my opinion as a fan of his movies. Uh, and I hope that he, that, that, that he starts a conversation, or I, I shouldn't say I hope. I did see, as I said in the reviews, that he was successfully starting a conversation about why. You know, why this tradition? Why would a black director, famous for making movie, you know, effective movies that prompt real conversations about race and inequality and, the, and racism in the United States, you know, why would he turn to this tradition? So in that kind of efflorescence of dialogue, I thought that added a whole other positive layer to him, to that movie. And we have a first question from the Zoom audience. Uh, Professor Carr? Yeah, I'm, I'm just over here. Ask, I'm, I'm on the ground floor asking the question. <laughs> I'm the voice of Zoom. <laughs> so um, there's a question here which concludes with a, a short question, which is, why don't we affirm that the classical world has always been African and Middle Eastern too? Can I read you the preamble to that, which is, the classical world was tricontinental, and some of the most important and influential classical authors were from Africa and the Middle East, Augustine and Lucian, just two obvious examples. It's early modern Europeans, as you've shown, that 
make proprietary, tangentious, and exclusive claims about the classical tradition. So given our vantage point, why not revise and rewrite, rewrite this um, Greece and Rome paradigm by emphasizing continuities, not only between Aristotle and Aquinas, but Aristotle and Ibn uh, Rushdi. In other words, why don't we affirm that the classical world has always been African and Middle Eastern too? Okay. Uh, it's such a good question. And I would say um, for probably 20 years, I was with that questioner in spirit. And, and, and um, the, you know, confident, as I said at the beginning, of the power of the tradition itself, you know, to do its own inviting, in a sense, because it had already done, it had done from the very beginning, always already, as we used to say in the 1990s, right? Um, it's a Derrida joke, joke for those of you who <laughs> didn't get that. Um, but the, but, you know, really over the last 10 years, and it, and I, I think it is, um, if I can draw on personal experience just to illuminate uh, this question, kind of make my answer a bit more concise, um, it is, I think, part of the, a result of the amount of time I've spent outside more elite, you know, well-off, highly selective institutions and seen, um, you know, how it feels and how it looks you know, to, to, uh, to people who, who don't have that confidence and, and have not really grounds on which to feel that they can claim it. Um, and whose confidence in, in, you know, the liberal with a little L um, tradition of, of, of equality and welcome uh, is undermined every single day. So, so part of it is that, I, I think too, and the more, um, the, the other half, the kind of the more intellectual um, history of ideas uh, side of, this, of, of my answer to this question goes back to Emmanuel Wallerstein's book, U European Universalism, because that, it's, a, it's, it's maybe not that Wallerstein's the only person who's written about this, but, um, but it's a very short, if you're short on time, it's a very short, um, quite hard-hitting series of lectures in which he points out the resilience of, of, of Europe and, you know, and the West to, to defend itself and justify itself by claiming exactly that, you know, that we've always been, we have always been bigger than ourselves. We have always, in fact, been these others that, yes, at times we exclude when it serves our purpose, but we can also embrace and welcome and celebrate when it serves our purpose. So it's that dynamic, you know, this is not new, uh, and uh, on Tuesday I'll talk a little bit about um, about, about Schlegel, who, was, uh, you know, who in the early 19th century was advocating for the study of Sanskrit to be included in the German university um, and received you know, big slap in the face as a result of that. Um, of, and so, so that's why I'm wary historically of, of that, um, that, that very confident claim that we can in fact be everything to everyone. Okay, um, it's like we have a Question from here, Professor Farrell. Is it okay if I take my mask off with a question? Just <clears throat> very uh, Joy, before I ask the question, <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh, before I ask the question, can I just say it would be very, very hard, if not impossible, to imagine a better start for this series than this lecture. I really, really loved what you said. And um, I want to ask a question that goes back to your point about Sepulveda, which um, is an episode that really deserves to be a lot better known than it is, and I'm, I'm sure you do know about it, but my experience is that most people don't, that his um, pronouncement about the kind of suitability in Aristotelian terms for slavery of the people of the New World was made in a debate against Bartolome de las Casas Sepulveda was somebody who had studied classics but never been to the New World. De Las Casas was a, a bishop in Mexico and he argued the opposite side of the case by saying, actually, you know what? Those people are more like the Greeks and Romans than we are. And my point here is that there are so many episodes that things that we hear as kind of you know, dicta from on high that create the world that we live in did emerge from really active dialogical situations and it's just depressing how long the people how often the people who are right lose those battles and so the question i want to ask you but it's kind of unfair to ask such a big question and expect an answer 
is really what are the forces that keep causing that to happen? Are they intrinsic to the discourse or are, are they extrinsic? Do they have to do with the way in which the discourse around classics has been adopted by people for ends that have very little to do with, with learning but have to do with the promotion of their own uh, situation? That's, that, that's too big a question. But I would like you to reflect a little bit on how you see dialogue taking us forward, real dialogue, not just in the academy, because I think that it would be relatively easy for people in the academy to change their minds about what classics is, but we have to change the world's mind. I know you may think, you may think that that's, that's overly optimistic, is that it'll be the first time that I think that I have been more optimistic about anything than you have. <laughs> but, but I do think that changing the minds of the world who have some sense of a vested interest in their being something like classics defined the way that it is, is an even heavier lift. So I'd just be interested in, in your reflections on that. Yeah, that, well, let, let, me take, um, <laughs> let me take the first of these two <laughs> huge questions. But, and this is exactly what we should be talking about, and, and, and we'll talk about it all next week and hopefully beyond, not, not just in this context. But the first one, I, I think in the, at the, it, when we look at the moments where um, looking at the De Las Casas Sepulveda debate, um, and, and the, as you pointed out, the repetition of these debates, and, and as why does the why does the bad guy win? Or, you know, why does the wrong side win out over and over and over? I think it it does. It's not the intrinsic nature of the material. Um, in my view, it's the it's the intersection of. Uh, uh, it's actually kind of two things. Well, it's more than two things, but it's the intersection of uh, the creation of a culture of study that's profoundly anti-market and anti-commercial and even kind of anti-worldliness in its retreat from the world and its focus on study with its, and its embedment, which has to be the case because someone has to feed the people who are doing the scholarly work in the worldly world that, you know, that is the world of politics and conflict, um, of, 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 national, um, of national identity formation and competition. And in, the, um, in that struggle, uh, and I think Bill Reddings in his book in the early 1990s, The University in Ruins, put this really well, um, although he's profoundly pessimistic, so I don't agree with him, but, um, but he puts this really, really perfectly, that the, the scholarly people who have chosen really to turn away from at least some of the worldly, important worldly workings of the world will never win out when it comes to those who master the worldly workings of the world. Um, and I, I just have to say, um, you know, kind of in this, as an aside, um, that, uh, but also because I know at least a couple of administrators are in the room, but this is one of the reasons I became an academic administrator because I was so frustrated about that and worried about that division and I, and I wanted to be part of healing that, that or, or you know, kind of bridging that divide. But, that, but I think that's, it's that those series of pain points that, um, that when scholarly debates reach points where they come, come close or maybe threaten to come close to tilting public opinion or, um, or pushing avenues of thinking that counter the market and the forces of, of political power arrayed right against it, it's just enormously difficult for them to win out. I hope, I mean, that is a very vague and general answer, but it's a, it's a big question. Um, on, the, on changing the minds of the world, you know, I don't, I don't know, and, and maybe this is my fundamental optimism again talking, I, I, um, I, I think that the, the, the emergent generation uh, has, a, uh, at least in, in, the, in the college and university world, are doing it, members of that generation are doing very important work in expressing a kind of this has to stop. <laughs> um, now, sometimes I can find this as a person over 50 frustrating and I don't know what to do with it. Um, I feel sometimes personally attacked and I get defensive because I have been living with the inequities and you know, the hierarchies my whole life and learning how to navigate them. And the people who are in their 20s will also do the same, even if they don't believe they will. But I believe that the injection of um, of, of a real urgency into, into the language, the calls for change coming from the emergent generation. They speak to me of um, the force of thinking past the categories you know, that have been chaining us. And, 
and one of those categories and the one that, that, um, that I think uh, you know, we're seeing playing out, especially in, in the, so I'm gonna move from the world to the academy and back again. We administrators praise the university and the college all the time for all the different countries, right, where students come from and where, you know, all the different countries faculty come from and, and we praise the global university. We could make so much more of that that would tap into especially young people's sense of impatience with national identity as uh, the source of, of, violent, uh, of violence and oppression. Uh, and that kind of, if, if that kind of message to be if, if we were as academics to you know, take hold of our own futures, take hold of our own departments and disciplines and say to the world outside, you, know, you may think we're a world of safe spaces and, and, you know, and, and butter, butterflies, no, snowflakes. Um, you, may, you, know, you may think we're all about, um, about constraining free speech and about uh, you know, all the other things you'll read about and not just on Fox News, right? Uh, but we in fact are apart from the world, but of it, and responding to it. And we are tapping the energy and the impatience of the younger generation and working to, you know, to remake the structures of thought in ways that help the world be a better place. Um, that, again, another really broad and general answer, but I really do feel like the forces are there to do it. Um, academic structures are hard to change, but there are human ones, and we can do it. We can do it if we wish. We've got a question right here. Um, oh, that's quite loud. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for your uh, lecture. I found it really uh, exciting as someone who is about to sort of begin their sort of journey through all this. Um, I'm starting a PhD next year and I want to work in sort of the deployments and the redeployments of the classics in the Caribbean. Um, and even though I'm yet to start this project, I find myself uh, increasingly unsettled by the idea um, of it being ethical to do this on my own, as like sort of thinking about my own positionality. Um, so I guess the question I have for you is um, in this sort of quest to co-create a new field from the ground up, do you see the sort of academic monograph or the single authored article as something that is increasingly going to lack value? Or do you think that there is still a value in such work? Um, or do you think that the humanities could sort of take a note from the scientific approach of sort of co-authorship as the sort of the norm? Oh, great question. And I, I mean, I, I have to say, I think you're, you're right. I'll say, talk a little bit about reception studies, as I said on Tuesday. And I think one of its biggest dangers is exactly this kind of rewriting of cultural imperialism and confidence into... Um, you know, we can understand the whole world because we understand Greek and Roman texts and they've had an influence on the whole world. And I think it's very, uh, we really need to think about this more carefully and, and kind of build a hermeneutics um, that, that, that's responsible and, and, um, and meaningful. So I think you're on the right track in thinking about collaboration. Um, and, and I think to, well, to your question about the humanities, uh, I, I am always struck by, and, and this isn't just from my experience as an academic administrator, I think I've always felt this, by how academics, faculty, scholars, who are brilliant people, nonetheless, when it comes to the question of the monograph and the peer-reviewed article, like, the world turns into a binary opposition, and it's either the one or the other. And if we give up on the one, it's lost forever. If we question the monograph and the peer-reviewed article as the only outcome of scholarship, we're all doomed. I mean, I'm not kidding. The, the intensity with which people, you know, look at the sky falling down when alternatives are put before them, and more seriously, and you know, all kidding aside, the, the real unwillingness at many schools to recognize this collaborative work, we're doing a little bit better with digital humanities these days, but multimedia work, um, let alone publicly engaged humanities work, and when I say recognize, I mean hire people doing it, give them tenure, give them promotion, give them merit raises, I mean really recognize, not just give them awards you know, at, an, at a society annual meeting. Um, it's real. So I, I absolutely believe that the amazing diversity and creativity of humanistic thinking and scholarship uh, deserves expression in multiple forms. And I 
I can't believe we're still where we are in terms of an inability to see beyond valuing the monograph and the peer-reviewed article. That said, again, do I believe that the monograph and the article are good things? Absolutely, but I feel like I shouldn't even need to say that. We, we should be able to really honor and, and figure out how to value um, different forms of work. Thanks. Another question on Zoom. Okay, uh, yes. So this question concerns the languages. As classics, especially Latin and Greek, are not effectively taught at the high school level for most schools across the United States, many of the lessons learned by these studies are lost on a large part of the population. How can we bridge the gap, so to speak, and change the stigma against dead languages so as to bring these stories and their lessons more effectively outside of academia and higher education? Huh, it's a good question, and I, now I feel, I'm starting to feel a little bit like a Johnny OneNote saying, you know, how optimistic I am. But but here, I, I think I think we're doing really well, um, actually, in this on this front. Um, I think of the, um, and I can hear my colleagues at, especially my my younger colleagues at ACLS laughing as I say this, but because um, uh, I'm sure I'll get the reference wrong. But Lil Nas X, you know, in his um, in his recent videos that do this amazing, talk about Afrofuturism, mishmash of, uh, and I mean that in a complimentary way, of you know, Egyptian motifs, um, Greek and Roman motifs, quotations from Plato. Uh, that's one example of where a very high profile uh, figure in music and, and, and the public and kind of the arts more generally, you know, dance and fashion and so on, um, is, uh, having no trouble at all, you know, deploying uh, Greek and Roman and, and other ancient material. Uh, I think the, 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 there's a lot of evidence that, that we can all see in the interest in, um, in TV shows, uh, in, um, and all my references are gonna be dated because I don't watch enough TV, and I'll say HBO Rome, HBO's Rome, and you'll say that was 20 years ago, right? But, or maybe not quite that long. Was but was it 20? Yeah, it was thank you, Peter. <laughs> Um, but uh, so I don't think there's we, I don't think the problem is interest actually, and this is one of the reasons again I feel confident that um, that that there's a lot of interest to work with. I also think it's very interesting to see in in um, in uh, wuxia, the popularity of, of wuxia movies in in the United States, um, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, or uh, the popularity of the new movies that send you know you. European or kind of Euro-American hero figures to fight in Asia. Um, this kind of, I think Matt Damon was recently in one of these films. Um, th there's, there's interest in that in a way, as corny as that movie that I, the Matt Damon in, in China movie, if I'm remembering correctly, probably was. That's a really interesting example of the much more kind of cosmopolitan approach to thinking about antiquities that characterizes public discourse and, and, the, and, and the movies um, and TV. And it's one that I think we should be in very dynamic, dynamic dialogue with. Professor Copeland. And someone will tell me the Matt Damon Asia movie if I, if I got that right. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I really appreciated the talk. It seems to have interesting resonances with the kind of work that Gayatri Spivak was doing um, some years ago on the death of a discipline in comparative literature and asking for a return to philology in a way. And I wonder, perhaps you'll address this next week, I'm thinking about expertise um, and I'm thinking about the place of expertise in, a, in, a, in, in the way in which we reimagine disciplinarity. Um, I'm right now involved in a project that's trying to think through the history of rhetoric globally. Um, and it's really easy to sit at your desk and reconceptualize the way you might write that history and indeed re-theorize the definition of rhetoric. But it's not easy to find expertise on the ground, expertise across the board. And so I just wonder in what ways you're imagining the role of creating new expertises. That, and, and you're absolutely right. And, and I, um, I, and I will talk about this on Thursday mostly, but the, you know, we all know how right now, looking at the, the war in, in Ukraine and, and the deformation of the meaning of words, I mean, that's the most recent case, but we could certainly look at um, 
20 years ago, Peter Brooks wrote a brilliant piece in the MLA publication profession about John Yu and the torture memo and the misuse of words, you know, and the, and the, and the need to be more attentive to words. I think there's, you know, there's just no better argument than that for an education, and then, you know, university college education, but also, you know, fields of study, scholarship that are devoted to getting words right and thinking about what they mean and, um, and raising these questions of truth and falsity uh, it, it, you know, ever higher in, 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 uh, in our public consciousness. So my thinking is very much, you know, bound up with the need to find uh, or create kind of institutional space for that, uh, for that work. Uh, just two quick points. I mean, Guy Spivak wrote this, def this book, you know, 20 years ago, and nothing has changed institutionally, and I'm sure she thought, just as I am hoping now, you know, that her intervention would make real difference. And, you know, I'm, it had lots of local, I'm not, I'm not diminishing the book, it's, we all still, you know, we remember it, if you, if you come across it, it's a great, it's a great um, intervention. But, to, but what I'm really talking about here is, you know, changing departmental names and changing who we hire and changing, you know, and, and making real decisions about resources. Um, this is a kind of reparations exercise, you know, on a global scale, right? And, uh, and, and so that will raise, I think, very interesting questions about, um, that I would hope would answer the, the calls uh, from students, from um, members of, you know, understudied populations in the United States and around the world to, you know, for um, assistance, for collaboration, um, for, um, for support, possibly in the forms of giving up. Right, because one of the, I've, I've talked about this idea with a few colleagues at ACLS and one of the questions, you know, that comes up immediately is, well, if you're thinking about ancient studies in a university that's traditionally devoted, you know, the devoted faculty lines to a department of classical studies and then kind of left people doing ancient studies in other regions of the world to fight it out for themselves department by department, Asia, you know, Asian studies, African studies, because in the contemporary university, we have departments of French and we also have departments of Asian studies, right? So this is another inequity that's in the back of my mind as I'm, as I'm thinking. But how they say, will this really work? Because won't it involve, you know, this kind of zero sum game? So my approach, my answer to that, and I hope I'm ultimately responding to your question is that, is that it's kind of, it's a, first of all, it's not a zero sum game if we transform this into you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I don't think right now in our fragmented, you know, a few people studying ancient China here and a couple people stu studying ancient Near East here and a bunch of people studying ancient Greece and Rome here and maybe one person studying the ancient Americas, you know, departmentally, we could talk about programs and we could talk about, you know, colloquia together and we could, that's not gonna change the real decisions about lines, right? That's not gonna change how we distribute graduate fellowships or design curricula. And it won't change, really most importantly, the intellectual questions we're asking. And I think when I think about the, you know, these public matters that we face, like, you know, like climate change, like democracy, uh, our traditions in conversation with each other have so much to offer in terms of illuminating how people in different regions of the world now are accustomed to looking at their own pasts. So setting, you know, setting up that tradition with attention to the specificity of language and the specificity of history, that's like something I could, I could go to a provost with. Um, that's something I could you know, put on my brochure for my students in good faith, not thinking that I was having, having to kind of defensively say, we know this looks like that, but in fact, we're really this. It would, it would, it would evade that kind of two-step, but preserve the scholarship that, and, and the scholarly habits that are about accuracy, expertise, um, um, mastery of diff difficult skills. So we're getting very close to time, but I think we might have time for just one more question, if you're okay, Joy. Of course. Yeah. Um, Jordy, are you uh, okay? Let's, Hi. We, let's wait for the mic. Um, I have a pragmatic question that very much relates to what you just said about reparations. Um, and just as like a tiny bit of background to this question, um, I was, I studied underground at Vassar where we had a very tiny Greek and Roman studies department with a massive endowment. Um, so it looked like just like on 
unfair amount of funding for the 10 people who are majoring. Um, and so I guess I have a two-part question. The first part is whether you see this sort of decentering of Greece and Rome as a deep platforming and whether you see that as like very much tied up in a financial redistribution and sort of like forcible and in intentional kind of taking from the wealth that classics has accumulated and giving it to departments that at the moment are very underfunded. That's my question. Yes, that's a really good question. The, um, I'm, I'm going to lean here on my answer to a, a book um, that I had the great pleasure of reading in draft, um, a book by an activist and, and leader of, she was recently the president of the DMOS Institute, um, Heather McGee. It's a book called The Sum of Us. And her, her basic argument is that, uh, going back to my zero-sum language of a minute ago, is that w one of the challenges of, of racial politics and dealing with racial in in inequality uh, and racism in the United States now is that both black people and white people, and this is a book she's explicitly argue, uh, she explicitly says she's really interested in black-white relations. She's acknowledging there are many other issues of racism that she's not contending with in this book. But because of the legacies of slavery, um, she's limiting to, to, uh, to black and white relations. And she says, for generations, we've been thinking of, of our relations, writ large, economic, social, psychological, romantic, et cetera, as, um, as a zero-sum game. So you know, if, if blacks, she says, if blacks win, that means whites lose, and that's and there's only so much of the pie, and that's, and she says, that is exactly the question, the the that mindset that we have to transcend. And one of her examples is um, the swimming pool in uh, the, the the many swimming pools around the country that were closed in the wake of desegregation laws because towns decided that they would rather not have a pool than have white children and black children swimming together in the same pool. And she says, you know, we're now at a, a point and started getting that point in the 90s where those pools started to be reopened. Everybody wins out of that. So in her book, she transforms that very simple metaphor into a number of quite complex situations, economic, social, legal, where um, she kind of works through what it, what it is to think about uh, the situation not as a zero-sum game, but as a rising tide lifts all, all boats. In the academic context, I mean, th this is where alliances and advocacy um, and confidence in, in, in the value of what we all have to offer collectively would really have to win the day. That, um, that it, it could, I hope it wouldn't be just a matter of taking the resources of a single de department and redistributing them you know, across the whole globe, but rather that the resources would be added to because this project is so exciting, because it has so much promise. Um, because it, you know, solves a number, as I've said a couple times, of epistemological and political and pedagogical problems. So, um, so to finish, um, part of it is undeniably doing the kind of redistribution you're talking about. And will that be painful for the people who have had these resources? Yes, but the pain can't be the end or the focus of the story, because the ultimate good that would come out of it is what we all want and what will make the whole enterprise better for us all and for the broader public, to go back to Joe's question a few minutes ago. Well, I think that's probably a good note to end on. Um, we could have questions, I think, through dinner and probably through breakfast tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, but uh, I think what we'll do now is uh, pause uh, our conversation for um, restorative uh, drink and food um, and get back at it next week on Tuesday. See you all here then. Thank you so much, Joy Connolly. Uh, wonderful. Thank night. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.